Authorities have found the body of a young woman in a wooded area of Arden Hills. Our wet weather is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Two more gold medals for the United States today. We'll have the latest from Sarajevo in a satellite report from Tom Hanneman. And state business leaders launch a campaign to repeal the income tax surcharge. The story in a moment. Let me show you something. I drove into Senex yesterday. They were having farm service days. Well, when I got there, I knew I was going to save a bundle. On tires, hardware, lube oil, seed, chemicals. And more, lots more. So I nailed down my crop plans and registered to win a free satellite receiving system. Now, I didn't overspend, mind you. I just sort of oversaved. Cinex is the country way, cause Cinex is you. Of all the medical tools available at Metropolitan Medical Center, there is one more powerful than all the rest. Not only can this medical tool diagnose illness, but it can prescribe specific treatment. It can also monitor other machines and direct them through complex procedures. What is this remarkable medical tool? You're gonna be all right, Pat. A human being. Great, great, thanks, Doc. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. From the new WCCO Television Communication Center in the Twin Cities, this is the 6 p.m. Report. With Dave Moore, Pat Miles, Mike Fairborn, and Ralph John Fritz. Good evening, everyone. The State Patrol and St. Paul Police have discovered the body of a young woman in a wooded area near Highway 10 and I-694. Authorities believe the woman is Linda Shoebottom, who disappeared Thanksgiving Day. Mike Walsher was at the scene when the body was taken away less than an hour ago. Mike? Right, Dave. Uh, the body has been taken away now. It was found uh, this afternoon here near the westbound lane of 694. It was found actually in a uh, wooded median area between the east and westbound lanes right across the road there. It was about 30 to 40 feet off the roadway in some woods, and the imprint of the snow that it left was clearly that of a female shape. The Ramsey County Medical Examiner pulled away with the body about uh, 5 o'clock, a few minutes after 5 o'clock this afternoon, accompanied by St. Paul Police investigators who have been following the shoe bottom developments and by uh, Minnesota Highway Troopers as well. The body was taken on to the Ramsey County coroners, presumably for positive identification, but as you mentioned, Dave, police authorities believe it is that of 22-year-old Linda Shoebottom who's been missing and presumed murdered since last Thanksgiving. Uh, we understand the suspect uh, in this case, Rick Shoebottom, her 34-year-old husband, told police where the body could be found. He assisted in the recovery of the body today, and we also understand the suspect in the case, Rick Shoebottom, did so in the presence of his own attorney and in the pre presence of the Ramsey County prosecutor, presumably the county attorney. There may be a news conference later on this evening, Dave, and uh, we'll be covering that and bringing you further details tonight on the 10 p.m. report. One other note I might mention, Rick Shoebottom, as many who followed this case know, got out of the Golden Valley uh, Health Center just a couple of days ago. He'd been in that health center as a voluntary inpatient for about 48 days. He uh, left himself a couple of days ago, and police had been worried because they didn't know where he was the last couple of days. Mike, we've gotten a word, a possible word, that there might be a news conference, uh, conference at 9 o'clock tonight. Do you have any confirmation of that, that? That's the word that we had earlier, Dave, and I, I believe that's the case. All right. Thank you very much. A St. Paul man who was working to make his neighborhood a safer place died last night as the victim of the crime that's been plaguing that particular University Dale area. Pat has that story. Dave, the victim of the armed robbery was 51-year-old Dennis Ryan, owner of a plumbing supply store on University Avenue. He was shot by an apparent robber and died just a short time later in the St. Paul Ramsey Hospital. The killer is still at large, and as Lisa Schroffer reports, many ironies in the case remain. Dennis Ryan knew better than to keep a lot of cash on hand at his plumbing parts store here on University Avenue. He'd been robbed, or almost robbed, five times in the last three years. His sons say Dennis Ryan died while being robbed of only $15. He was killed without putting up a struggle. The guy had his money. You know, he didn't have to shoot. He didn't have to shoot. There's an added twist to his death. Ryan and his wife Beverly had spent the last few months trying to console a close friend, a sister of Linda Shoebottoms. 
She's the St. Paul woman who's missing and presumed dead. Last night, the tables turned. Yeah, I've been over there because I know what she's going through right now. And it's just, Bev and I were just talking about criminals being on the loose yesterday. And now, now we have another one out on the street. The 51-year-old businessman had maintained the company his father founded for more than 30 years. Ryan was active in a council that's been trying to clean up University Avenue, rid it of prostitution, and make it a safer place to run a business. The four-block section of University Avenue that runs from Victoria to Dale Streets gets a lot of attention from police. Since November, they've been called out on almost 300 crimes on that stretch, ranging from robbery to assault to rape. Ryan's store, where three of his sons work, was closed for business today, but friends dropped in all morning. There will be a visitation tomorrow afternoon at the East Chapel of Mueller Beast Funeral Home. Ryan's funeral will be held Saturday. Lisa Schrofer, WCCO Television News, St. Paul. In recent years, there has been a virtual epidemic of residential burglaries. Today in Minneapolis, a man was charged with several of them and was then implicated in scores of other break-ins. Caroline Lowe is here with more on this story for us. Caroline? Pat, the suspect is 21-year-old Stephen Raymond Davidson of St. Paul, who appeared today in Hennepin District Court. Davidson has been charged with three counts of second-degree burglary. According to a criminal complaint, he's been linked to at least 35 other burglaries, and perhaps as many as 100 since August of 1982. Authorities say the numbers are high, but that it's not unusual to match up one suspect with a lot of other cases. Sometimes works in the interest of, of suspects to clean up their acts, so to speak, uh, to admit their involvement uh, in other uh, offenses so that they're not later identified and charged uh, while they're still involved in litigation for present events. Investigators allege that Davidson and two other suspects took property from homes throughout the metro area and western Wisconsin. Most incidents occurred in the early morning hours. The property reportedly included $200,000 worth of jewelry, silver, and coins. The criminal complaint also claims the items were taken to Rogers Coin Shop in St. Paul, where they were sold. The owner of the shop says the charges are not accurate, saying he only made four purchases from the suspect in the past year, and that he has invoices to prove it. Davidson now faces charges in other counties where he allegedly was involved in other burglaries. Meanwhile, Hennepin authorities say they have found all the victims who own the stolen property and they have been notified. All right, Caroline, thank you very much. The mayor of suburban Apple Valley has resigned after being linked to a swindle of money from a daycare center there. Marla San Overgaard, who has been mayor of Apple Valley for three years, allegedly swindled $2,500 from a playgroup, a daycare center where she had been a bookkeeper. She was charged yesterday. The Apple Valley City Council will meet now to select an interim mayor to serve until the next election. Dave? A black Columbia Heights family is fearful tonight after discovering a burned cross in their backyard today. 42-year-old Bob Pratt said he looked out his kitchen window today to discover a four-foot cross standing in his backyard. Mr. Pratt called police who removed the cross for evidence in their investigation. Mr. Pratt said he's concerned for the safety of his wife and, of course, of his seven children. If they got the nerve to do that, they got the nerve to go further. If they really mean business. They're going to come up and set your house on fire. The Pratt family has lived in the neighborhood just six months and have found it to be a friendly place to live, but Bob Pratt says he will not let one isolated act of racism frighten him and his family away. Coming up on the 6 p.m. report, we'll find out why businesses all across Minnesota have begun a letter-writing campaign on the state's income tax surcharge. I'm Rodney. I'm Dull. Hi, Rodney. It happened to me like it happens to everyone. The same dull songs over and over on the radio. Up the dial dull, down the dial dull. Now I wake up dull, drive to work dull. Isn't there some place I can turn on the FM dial? Some kind of music that isn't dull? Yes, Rodney, there's country. FM Country K102. More music, less dull. FM Country K102. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the text of the President's statement. I will now take questions. When is the sale? Sound of Music's President's Day sale is now in progress at all eight stores. Will all merchandise be affected? Yes, home and car stereo, TVs, video recorders, <laughs> portables, microwave ovens, and major appliances are all on sale. What is the public's reaction? The public is totally in support of these low prices, but we suggest people shop early for best selection. Could you give us an example of the savings? I'd rather let the President himself do that.
This AM FM cassette car stereo, 14 watts of power, just nineteen ninety nine. Something's happening in the Twin Cities. People who used to buy cars are buying trucks. Your Metropolitan GMC truck dealers want to show you why your next car should be a truck. Like the GMC S15 pickup. Or the Jimmy, a car and a truck all in one. Perfect in the city and in the country. GMC, the official truck of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. At a price you can afford. See your Metropolitan GMC truck dealer today. For a truck you can live with. America's most popular replacement battery has a new lean challenger. The Motivator 650. Made by Delco Remy for Kmart, the 650 is smaller than the standard Die Hard, yet it delivers 125 more cold cranking amps. The maintenance free Motivator 650, just $59 and backed by the K Care Promise. Eden Prairie school teachers have authorized a strike in that school district. Teachers met this afternoon to be briefed on the negotiations with the administration. 87% of the teachers voting this afternoon came out in support of a strike. The earliest strike date would be March 1st. The district employs 600 teachers. Minnesota's 10% income tax surcharge is scheduled to continue to take a bigger chunk out of our paychecks until July 1985. But business leaders across the state are stepping up the campaign to axe the tax early. Mike Strand reports. Voting for this bill. I hope there the are surtax arose from the depths of the recession the as lawmakers desperately grappled for a way really to trim growing budget shortfalls. The result of that crisis was the 10% additional tax levy, which comes out of our paychecks and adds hundreds of dollars a year to our steep tax burden. Business groups are now pressuring state lawmakers to live up to promises that the income surtax be only temporary. Lawmakers from both political parties and the governor favor removal of the 10% tax, but the conflict and eventual political infighting will be over when to drop it and by how much. A consortium of businesses led by the State Commerce and Industry Association and the Minnesota Business Partnership is gearing up for the fight. The group plans a major advertising assault on the surtax issue starting tomorrow, using election year leverage to lift the tax earlier than planned. Public pressure could well build so that at least those who are running for office this next fall might well see the wisdom of being closer to January 1, 84, than anywhere else. But then, if we do that, you don't have the revenues to do a lot of other things. DFL Senate leader Roger Moe says he and others are concerned about the growing budget deficits facing Congress. And he says unless federal spending is brought under control, Minnesota could face another budget crisis. If we do what everybody is suggesting we do, we uh, are following that same blueprint uh, for disaster that we followed back in the early 80s. But Senator Moe may be outnumbered. Besides the ad campaign, thousands of businesses are lobbying their employees to get on the repeal bandwagon. Major firms like General Mills and the Pillsbury Company have written to their workers urging them to contact their lawmakers. The debate over the surtax is likely to be the most heated of the session this spring, but it's unlikely the full extent of the repeal, if any, will be known until the wee hours of April 20th or beyond. With photographer Bob Mannery, Mike Strand, WCCO Television News, the Twin Cities. On the other hand, Governor Perpich is proposing taxes to beautify our roadsides. Today, the governor said a $1 tax on motor vehicle transfers and a $1 tax on the purchase of new tires would generate about $3.5 million annually. The money to be used to get rid of unsightly piles of tires and such debris along the roadside. Also to be used for natural screening of auto salvage yards and to uh, remove abandoned vehicles. Fifty employees of the Ford Truck Assembly Plant in St. Paul are to be laid off by March first to make way for out-of-town Ford workers who have more seniority. The union contract with the company requires that the jobs be given to laid-off workers who have more uh, seniority. The union local is trying to contest the national policy, but at this point, it's not known if the local workers will remain on their jobs. Pat? Dave, a company in Fridley says it may have the solution to the problems of Times Beach, Missouri. That is the site of heavy contamination by dioxin, a chemical linked to several serious health problems. The Agro-K Corporation began experimenting last summer with an enzyme produced by bacteria. It was a 
applied to ground contaminated with dioxine about 15 miles from Times Beach. Tests showed more than half the dioxine disappeared. Those tests, though, were limited, so the company now plans more tests in April with the help of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. We met with the Department of Natural Resources and their scientists, and they were very excited at the results that we have developed. So it is going back to our uh, curiosity and our interest to try to find if there is a solution that uh, can be man-made. Agro-K began in 1976. It makes products for environmental and agricultural use. The company's president says the enzyme under testing may be useful against toxic waste. However, the federal EPA says it wants to see more test results before deciding. Mike Fairborn gave us a rainy day, but it wasn't uh, cool at all, really. It really wasn't. Very mild outside, uh, continuing to melt the snow. And we had about five hundredths of an inch of rain at the National Weather Service. I swear it rained more where I was. Caught out without the umbrella. Oh, were you? <laughs> How about you? Well, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Uh, well, like we say, not a great deal of rain in the bucket out at the National Weather Service, but there was more than that around parts of the Twin Cities today. 41 degrees is what we reached for a high and 37 for a low, so that was another whole 24 hours of doing nothing but melting off, uh, I should say, what little bit of snow there is left out there. We've lost a considerable amount of snow now since Friday of last week, so we've gone from 15 inches down to less than 6 inches now in less than a week. What we have going on right now is a low pressure area to the south of us. This low pressure area is fairly intense, and it's uh, continuing to produce quite a bit of shower activity. Not so much thunderstorms today as yesterday, but a lot of shower activity, and of course that's moving up into our region. Right now, where the colder air is up to the northwest of us, a little bit of that is becoming mixed with snow, and that should move across the northern part of the state. And earlier today, you can see what was happening on the radar. Now, notice the way this, these radar, uh, radar echoes are moving from southeast to northwest, a very unusual pattern for us, but that indicates that the circulation is counterclockwise around that big low pressure area to the south of us. Live radar still indicates a little band of showers out to the west, so throughout the night tonight, we can still expect some light shower activity, some light rains, and that's going to continue through most of the day tomorrow until we finally draw enough colder into the system that it may change over to a little bit of snow by tomorrow afternoon. Satellite picture shows the clouds, shows the spiraling rotational uh, uh, configuration of that huge storm down in the central plains. We're watching another one out here to the west too because that's the one that could affect us even more. It's moving into the same slot as the last one. This storm will move off to the northeast and as we said draw some cold air into it. This storm out here is going to drop to the south and then hook also to the northeast so it looks like even over the weekend and into the first part of next week we're certainly going to stay on the wet side. The uh, computers are saying that we could see up to a half an inch of rain here over the southeastern corner of the state with parts of Iowa receiving over an inch. And there's the rain snow line that's going to be fairly close to us and so it looks like it'll be mostly in the form of rain as we stay mild tomorrow but then the cooler air coming in should slowly change us over to at least some flurry activity by tomorrow afternoon tomorrow night. 39 right now, 79% uh, humidity, winds out of the east at 8, 29, 9, 3, and the barometer is rising. Cloudy, periods of light rain, low of 35 degrees. Tomorrow, more of the same, cloudy with periods of light rain, a high temperature of 40 degrees. Then tomorrow night, lingering showers becoming mixed with snow, dropping down to 28 and Saturday, rain and snow mixed with a high temperature of 38. Our extended forecast calls for a chance of snow on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, partly cloudy, highs in the 30s, lows between 15 and 20. All right, we keep talking about the snow, but so far we haven't seen it. Not yet. <laughs> right, glad we haven't. Thank you, Mike. The man who was suing religious deprogrammers for $5 million was back on the witness stand today. A report is coming up next on the 6 p.m. report. Here we go, fellas. I love Schmidt beer. I love the deep well water they use, the golden barley, the choice hops. Well, I love it so much, I just got to buy that little gal over there, Schmidt. Oh, that's Billy Bob's girl. Well, then I'll buy that little gal over there, Schmidt. Oh, that's Larry Lee's girl. Well, then I'll just buy this pretty little bartender, Schmidt. Look at him! That's my girl. Well, I do believe I'll drink this Schmidt myself. Around here, whether it's snow or no snow, you need the extra traction you get with front wheel or four wheel drive. Your Toyota dealer has 17 Toyota models that could give you the extra traction you need. Now's the time to make your deal on a front wheel or four wheel drive Toyota. But supplies limited, don't you be left out in the cold. Extra traction with Toyota front wheel or four wheel drive. That's the big attraction at your Toyota dealers now. Do you have a lawyer? Most Americans don't. 
That's why we started Hyatt Legal Services, a new kind of law firm now with offices throughout the country where you can discuss your problem with an attorney for just $20. And for cases like divorce, bankruptcy, and wills, we have standard fees that are very reasonable. At Hyatt Legal Services, we care about you. I'm Joel Hyatt, and you've got my word on it. Hyatt Legal Services has offices throughout the area. Call the one nearest you for an appointment. On Tuesday, Bill Eilers told a packed Minneapolis courtroom that a harsh childhood and later involvement with drugs led him to religion and a fundamentalist sect in Wisconsin. Mr. Eilers is suing the people who tried to deprogram him from that sect. Pat? In fact, Dave, he has filed a $5.1 million lawsuit against the deprogrammers who took he and his wife into custody back in August of 1982. Bill Eilers then escaped after six days and was in court today for more testimony on the case. Jim Newman That's just right. returned. That's okay. right, Pat. Friction between Bill Eilers and his family reached its peak a few weeks before the abduction of Bill and his wife, Sandy. The hostility developed following Bill Eilers' decision to join the group called the Followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, in sometimes emotional testimony, Eilers described the heated arguments that led up to that abduction. Eilers said numerous friends and relatives visited the farm where he and his wife Sandy lived after joining the religious sect. Bill Eilers said those visitors accused the couple of being members of a cult. Eilers told the jury he responded to those attacks. He compiled negative information about the Lutheran and Catholic churches and then fought back. Eilers recounted telling his Catholic stepfather of a convent where the murdered remains of a thousand babies born to nuns were supposedly discovered. Said Eilers of his father-in-law's reaction to hearing that accusation, quote, Lloyd started to stutter, cocked his arm back like he was going to hit me but I think he was afraid to. Then he began his assault on my religious beliefs. Bill Eilers described the argument that followed as a religious war. A few weeks later, Bill and his pregnant wife Sandy were abducted while in Winona for Sandy's regular prenatal checkup. Eilers, who escaped a week later, described today his terror in the hands of the deprogrammers. Eilers, I prayed, Lord Jesus, please keep me. Please don't let me go crazy. I was terrified. By Wednesday, Eilers testified today. He had decided to fake deprogramming. He told the jury the decision came after torture. He described a room where tape-recorded music was played loudly in his ear, where he was denied bathroom rights. He fooled his captors, Eilers told the jury. He was allowed to see his wife, Sandy, whom he found to have changed. Eilers, she was repulsed by me and very much attracted to the man who deprogrammed her, who was dirty and greasy and wore a ring with a snake on it. While being transferred to another location, Eilers rolled out of a moving car. He told the jury today that in the commotion that followed, he escaped. Tomorrow, Eilers will be cross-examined by the attorney for the defendants in the case, which, Pat, you know, is the group of deprogrammers involved. All right, very good. Thank you, Jim. We will have the latest on the Olympics from Sarajevo and the highlights of the Gophers' last-second victory last night coming up next on Mark Rosen's Sports Report. You keep your milk of magnesium, and I will keep my Senecot. Natural vegetable Senecot laxative, tablets or granules. I can count on Senecot. Sure, farming is hard work, but it takes a lot of thinking, too. I thought long and hard before I tried new buttrel corn herbicide last year. I found it does more than stop broadleaf weeds. It stops me from worrying about vapor drift and stalk brittleness. When you stop and think about it, it just makes sense to use buttrel, the post-emergent herbicide that does its job and stops. Stop weeds, stop worry. The buttrel stops here. On the next edition of Our Magazine, Alice star Vic Tabak talks about his recovery from surgery. To this day, people still say, geez, you're walking. Plus, Stephanie Powers, David Horowitz on dangerous lookalikes. Be aware of this stuff, because your child could be poisoned. And how to choose the right cruise for you on the next edition of Our Magazine. Friday at 9 a.m. here on WCCO Television. The U.S. Olympians made a nice comeback today. 
Well, we knew they were going to win one of those golds. Bill Johnson's been telling the world he's going to win that uh, gold medal all along, Dave. And uh, Scott Hamilton wins the other for the United States head in figure skating. Johnson is a young, carefree Californian who, because of his time trials and the course fit his style, was expected to win, especially by himself. His confidence paid off at the fastest downhill speed in Olympic history. There's a speed limit in the States. I think I broke it today. <laughs> Bill, you're going to be made into certainly into something of an American sports hero, a very big thing. What does that mean? Can you, you talk about that a little bit? About millions. <laughs> We're talking millions. <laughs> Well, that speed was 65 miles per hour, folks. And America's second gold medal of the day, no surprise, Scott Hamilton won the men's figure skating gold after today's free skating event. It was the first U.S. men's figure skating championship for the gold in 24 years. On Saturday, the 90-meter jumping will be held. Channel 4's Tom Hanneman has more on the sport and U.S. coach Greg Winsberger of Minneapolis. Of all the events here at the Winter Olympics, none appears more suicidal than 90 meter ski jumping. Athletes lift off this ramp at 60 miles an hour, sometimes soaring over 400 feet. Indeed, they look and sound like human Learjets. Competition in this sport has been intense here in Sarajevo, both on the jump and off. Most coaches now videotape their athletes to study form and correct problems. At today's practice, two U.S. and Soviet coaches stood shoulder to shoulder as they recorded their jumpers. The United States has never won an Olympic medal in ski jumping, but this weekend here on the 90-meter hill at Malopoli, the U.S. will have its best shot yet. The 90 meters traditionally are better hill. We're better on the bigger hills. This hill is uh, an extremely difficult 90 meter, uh, a lot of horizontal flight, uh, which is, again, favors the way our guys ski. So, again, we just hope we have the right kind of conditions and the right kind of luck. And uh, if the winds are favorable like they are today, I feel we can do well. Much of Greg Winsberger's optimism is based upon the recent performances of America's top jumper, Jeff Hastings of Norwich, Vermont. Hastings became only the second American to win a World Cup meet last December in Lake Placid. Since then, he's jumped with the world's best. Clearly, America's 90-meter medal hopes rest on his shoulders. Just how good are America's chances here? I try not to anticipate things or put pressure on the guys that's talking medals because it's so close in this sport and they're among the guys that could win. Uh, I only want the guys to technically ski as good as they possibly can and the rest will take care of themselves. They will be medalists. Americans have never paid much attention to ski jumping. But who knows? If Jeff Hastings wins a medal here this weekend, interest in this sport may take off. Tom Hanneman, WCCO Television Sports, Sarajevo. Back home in college basketball, Jim Dutcher said last night's win felt like a reprieve. Indeed, the executioner's song was almost the same as it was at Indiana. The Gophers squandered a 15-point lead but rallied to beat Wisconsin 68-67. Let's set the scene for you. Now, the Badgers had the ball, a three-point lead, and instead of sitting on both, Corey Blackwell went to the hoop and missed a reverse layup. Blackwell leads the Big Ten in scoring, but didn't score any points with Coach Steve Yoder on that move. Mark Wilson sank his drive, and now Minnesota trailed by one. Here's another crucial mistake. Facing full court pressure, Wisconsin fails to inbound the ball. They should have called timeout to set up a play. It opened an opportunity for Dutcher to plot the plan. The scheme was to get the ball to Roland Brooks. The ball was worked around until Brooks had no choice but to shoot here as time was running out. And despite being hounded closely, Brooks hit nothing but net. The Gophers got the reprieve, thanks to Roland and and some shoddy Wisconsin moves. The Gophers play a non-conference game uh, at Cincinnati this Saturday. And the Vikings have a new defensive backfield coach. Bill Belichick comes to us from the Vikings. And the Vikings' uh, Jed Hughes re uh, goes on to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. A body found today at the intersections of Highway 10 and I-694 may or may not be that of the missing Linda Shoebottom. Mike Walsher has been on the scene since the discovery. We're going back to him now. Mike? Right. I'm at the scene, Dave, where the body was discovered uh, this afternoon and uh, taken away at about 5 o'clock in Arden Hills. 
We're at the intersection of Highway 10 and 694. We understand the body has been identified by Ramsey County authorities. They will re not release the name of the victim, though, pending notification of the family. We also do, do have it on good authority that St. Paul Police do believe it is the body of 22-year-old Linda Shoebottom, missing, presumed murdered since last Thanksgiving. The chief suspect in the case, Rick Shoebottom, her husband, is in police custody. He assisted police in finding the body today. A news conference at 9, Dave, and an apparent solution to an agonizing mystery for the Shoebottom family. We'll have an update at 10. Fine. At which time we hope you'll be with us. Until then, thank you and good night.